Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that this House has considered the role of local government in reaching net zero. I thank members from across the House who supported the application and the Backbench Business Committee for granting this debate on World Environment Day. Madam Deputy Speaker, this government would ignore at its peril the vital role of local authorities in delivering net zero. The Climate Change Committee, National Audit Office and the Independent Review of Net Zero all agree that the UK cannot meet its net zero targets without local authorities. The CCC shows that local authorities have influenced over a third of UK emissions. The net zero strategy puts the figure at 82%. Local authorities determine what is built in our communities, how we get from place to place, how we reduce our waste, and much more. They are best placed to understand their communities and deliver policies that fit their place. These communities are let down by a Westminster government that prevents local authorities from decarbonizing their areas according to their need. 40% of people trust their local authority the most to act on climate change. This is much higher than the face they place in central government or business. It is time the government treated local authorities as equal partners and gave them the funding and powers they need to reach net zero. On that point, happy to give way. I'm grateful to her for giving way and congratulating her on this uh, important debate. On the issue of funding, does she agree that as well as reversing the 13 years of serious cuts to local authorities, which are preventing them from being able to green the, uh, the, the elements of their area that they would like to do, we also need to move away from piecemeal competitive funding just for specific projects, because that means that they can't actually plan long term. It means councils waste a huge amount of time bidding against each other rather than actually getting the funding they need to roll this out now. I totally agree, and she's preempting what I'm going to say later in my speech, but absolutely, the competitive process um, is just wasting so much time and so much local resources that could be actually spent on delivering this, these projects. Madam Deputy Speaker, over 300 local authorities have set a net zero target and declared a climate emergency. 132 councils have net zero targets for 2030 or sooner. Liberal Democrat-run councils have had remarkable successes in implementing sustainable green policies against a backdrop of substantial barriers. They could do so much more. My Bath and North East Somerset Council have become the first in England to adopt an energy-based net zero housing policy. This ensures that any new housing development is energy self-sufficient and puts a limit on building emissions. My council is also the first in the West of England to adopt a biodiversity net gain policy. But these brave initiatives cannot survive unless central government is truly behind such progressive policies and supports local authorities rather than undermining them, particularly when it comes to planning applications that can then go to appeal and developers get their way and don't build the green buildings that we need. Beyond Bath, the Liberal Democrat Council in Cheltenham has implemented a Green Deal, which has helped local business to invest in solar panels and heat pumps, led by the Liberal Democrat parliamentary candidate. And hopefully he'll soon tell us all about it once we have had a general election. In Richmond, the Liberal Democrat Council has been independently recognized as one of the 123 cities and boroughs across the globe for taking bold environment action by CDP, the global non-for-profit charity that runs disclosure systems and is regarded as the gold standard for environmental reporting. In Stockport, Liberal Democrats successfully implemented the Stockport Schools Climate Assembly. This involved young people from several schools coming together to learn about proposed debate and vote on climate action ideas. Their first task was to make sustainable and biodegradable period products more available in schools. The council responded and created a program which delivered funding and training to implement this. Stockport Council have called on the Manchester Mayor to roll out these school climate assemblies across the region. And I go further. I think we should have them across the UK. Young people, I'm happy to give I thank the member for giving way and also congratulate her for this debate. In Manchester, we have seen Manchester City Council prioritising reducing its impact on the climate with the ambitious zero carbon by 2038. Even with the great work happening, local authorities require more support. So does the member agree that in order for effective and efficient net zero plans to be met, 
the government must make funding more certain and long term. Absolutely, I agree. Um, I, and, and we just need councils to sort of really spread their wings and deliver. Um, but they cannot if they don't have the funding that has to ultimately come from central government. But local authorities, local councils, Manchester, Bath, uh, uh, Brighton, wherever we are, um, local authorities should really have the freedoms and the money to make their own decisions for their local um, communities. We Liberal Democrats recognize the importance of community buy-in. We need to win hearts and minds to persuade people that net zero projects are good for their communities. Only with the consent of the people from our communities can we deliver the path to net zero. That is why it is so vital to empower local authorities as much as possible. More and more power and decision-making has been eroded away from local government during the last decade. This must stop and it must be reversed. Local authority spending power has fallen dramatically since 2015, largely due to central government grants being cut by more than 40% over this period. Spending per person has decreased in real terms for 79% of local authorities between 2015 and 2022. The less money local authorities have to spend, the less climate action they can take. While I welcome this government's recent increase in local authority funding, it is far too little. UK 100 has pointed out that the funding process from central government for net zero pro projects is opaque, sparse and competitive. Even the new Department for Energy Security and Net Zero has admitted they do not know how many grants there are. The competitive tendering process whereby every local council rushes for a small amount of money is completely inadequate when it comes to the enormous task to deliver net zero. On that point. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for, for giving way and congratulate her on securing this debate. Um, uh, in my area, St Albans City and District Council has just won a staggering £8.5 million from a government fund to make homes energy efficient and to reduce bills. And it's the largest sum of money won of any council of our particular size. But even that sum of money will only go towards um, uh, making 900 uh, properties energy efficient. That's about a fifth of the overall total. So would she, would she agree with me that if councils were no longer forced to compete against each other time and time again, that actually councils like St Albans could go further, faster, because we know that our communities are chomping at the bit to get this stuff done. Well, I congratulate my Honourable Spence Local Authority for getting that amount of money, which is obviously welcome, but it is not enough. And I think um, the Minister uh, will hear from across the House that one of the things that is a real problem is the competitive process, which wastes time and money, um, and really that money could be spent directly into the projects that it is going. Will the Honourable Member give way? I'm happy, happy to do I'm grateful to the Honourable Member giving way, because the, the reality is we've got to talk about scale here as well. When I look at York, we want 73,000 heat pumps, 22,000 new connections to sustainable district heat systems, 44,100 homes need retrofitting and 24,000 need uh, micro-generation through solar energy, all by 2040. So if we don't scale up the funding, we will never reach the targets we're planning to do. Uh, indeed, and uh, I thank her for, for, for that intervention. I think we all need to grasp the enormity of what needs to be done and the scale of that and the ambition um, that the central government has is just not big enough. Whereas I find in local authorities, the ambition is very high and the, and the will to really deliver on that, on, 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 that, uh, on that high ambition is much bigger than what we currently see from uh, central government. In the updated net zero strategy, the government agreed to simplify the funding process. Local authorities, to give a figure to this, have spent £130 million since 2019 just for applying for competitive funding pots. £130 million which could have gone into the actual projects. Yes. I'm grateful to her for giving way. The scale of the challenge facing local areas in terms of housing and bringing homes up to decent standards requires large-scale funding. She's absolutely right about making sure that's uh, provided equitably across the country. And if we're serious about net zero, the government needs to provide the appropriate funds for 19 million homes in our country to be retrofitted so that they can be up to the EPC standard and, and also benefit in terms of reducing energy costs to millions of households. That's the lack of ambition. That, that's the kind of ambition we need to see that's lacking at the moment with the government. Uh, does she agree with me that that's what we need to see the government do urgently? Well, I agree and I couldn't put... 
I couldn't have put it better, so I thank you for that intervention. Uh, let me come back just to the grants that we were, we were discussing earlier. Current grants are rigid and tied to certain areas. This means council can an end up with money for projects which are not right for their communities. So not only have we not, not got enough money, when we do have money, it's often not the right sort of money or what our communities need. For example, a council could receive money for additional bus lanes when increased bus services would be preferred, or they might receive money designated for e-bikes when that is not really right for the needs of the community. Net zero grants must be made more flexible to help local authorities spend the money on projects that work in their area. The government has spent more time blocking local authorities than it has so far in empowering them. Many councils I have spoken to said that central government is the biggest barrier they face in implementing net zero policies. Take onshore wind. 77% of people would support a new onshore wind farm in their area. People know that renewables are the solution for our energy crisis. However, the government's effective ban on onshore wind has denied communities this investment. And housing is another example. We've already heard many of them. The UK has some of the leakiest homes in Europe. Net zero will remain a pipe dream in the absence of a huge and comprehensive retrofit program. We really need to understand the scale and we need the money to there, therefore retrofit in the, in the way we need. Would she give way again? Yes. I'm grateful to her and I'm very grateful that she's recognising both the issues around funding that are a problem but also around regulatory frameworks that are a problem as well. She'll know that a report by UK 100 has said that local authorities face what they call Kafka-esque barriers to pursuing net zero. One of those is in the area of transport and the all-party group for a Green New Deal, uh, she will know, undertook a, an inquiry on transport and concluded that we need local authorities to have the powers and the funding to modernise their own local public transport networks. They need those powers. Does she agree? Yeah, yeah. Uh, indeed, and again, um, she's preempting slightly what I'm coming to in a minute, but uh, absolutely, local authorities need just much more control over what is happening in, in, in their local transport uh, provision. Uh, it, is, it is wholly inadequate, and if we really want to pro provide an alternative to motorised um, um, travelling, um, we need a good local transport and bus services, and we don't have that, and local communities are crying out to design those and implement those. But local authorities must be a, a key partners as only local authorities have the structure and relationship to deliver the programs that have, we've been um, talking about. Uh, coming back to, um, to housing, we Liberal Democrats have campaigned relentlessly to get the government to introduce higher efficiency standards for new builds and not wait until 2025. It is irresponsible to delay further and hamstring local authorities to raise standards. And it is ridiculous that we are building homes now that need to be retrofitted yeah in five or ten years' time. Yeah, yeah. That must, is such a waste of time. Why not regulate now to build the houses for the future? The chair of the National Climate Change Committee has termed this as a stunning failure by the governments to decarbonise homes, and I fully agree. Planning and listed building laws also contribute to our leaky buildings. We, Liberal Democrat, run councils with some of the most precious building, uh, historic buildings and streetscapes in the country, like my city in Bath. This is a blessing and a curse. We represent one of the most beautiful areas in the world, but we are often unable to retrofit and reduce the emissions of historic houses and buildings. Currently, national planning policy puts heritage concerns above climate concerns. Mm. This is counterproductive. If councils are not able to retrofit these properties and make them more energy efficient, many will become uninhabitable. Yes. I'm grateful for the Honourable Lady giving way because I want to raise another issue which needs to be addressed, and that's of skills. We simply do not have the skill supply to do the retrofit at the scale that we need, whether it's on historic buildings or indeed new um, build, and therefore to start injecting uh, that focus on skills is going to be absolutely crucial, but we need to do it now, again, to be able to deliver in time. Indeed, and we, we need really a government that understands how this all fits together. We cannot um, really retrofit our homes if we don't have the supply chains, but also the skills. Therefore, we need to already talk to um, uh, FE providers or universities um, so that we get the skills for the future. But all this needs to come together. And currently, there is a, a lack of plan and vision um, that is deplorable. But again, local authorities have actually understood that, and they're starting to have these conversations. Um, and central government should really look at local authorities and see them as equitable partners. 
In designing future planning policy, we need central government to give more weight to climate concerns to local authorities, so local authorities can make our beautiful buildings habitable and fit for purpose. The Planning Act also must be bound to the Climate Change Act, so climate change can take, a, can take greater weight in planning decisions. The Royal Town Planning Institute argues that nothing should be planned without having first demonstrated it is fit for a net zero future. Um, and this would also um, solve some other issues. A major barrier why renewable projects are waiting up to 15 years to connect to the grid is because the planning approval process is not adequately focused on the urgency to deliver net zero. Local authorities are also constrained when it comes to managing transport. Surface transport is the largest emitting sector in the UK. The benefits of supporting active travel far outweighs the cost. People walking, wheeling and cycling in 2021 took 14.6 million cars off the road. This saved 2.5 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions and avoided more than 29,000 early deaths. Independent modelling suggests that even if 50% of vehicle sales were electric by 2030, car mileage would still have to decrease by more than half to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Investment in active and sustainable travel is therefore essential. Unfortunately, the decision to deregulate buses means that bus operators run routes primarily based on profitability. This has led to thousands of bus routes being closed. Between 2021 and 22 alone, 1,100 bus services were cut, including 51 in the southwest region. The government must empower local authorities to franchise bus services and simplify the franchise application system. The government must also reverse the ban on local authorities setting up their own bus companies. Only, they can, only then can our bus routes be determined by the needs of local communities rather than the need to make a profit. Active travel is not prioritised when the government decides what infrastructure projects to fund. Instead, the Government Department for Transport Web Tech model provides funding for travel schemes which have a perceived economic benefit. This means schemes which lead to higher volumes of faster traffic. Councils have been told that money for an access road to the city centre would not be awarded if traffic levels reduced due to reduction in economic activity. They have also been told that, that a pedestrian crossing could not be implemented due to cost of delay to traffic. These decisions fly in the face um, um, of, of really tackling um, the climate emergency. The active tra travel schemes are usually built is when they, are, they do not require these appraisals by the uh, Department for Transport. And the government and the local authorities need to have the powers and financial control to build them. Local authorities should have the power to access transport funding using alternative justifications to WebTAC and WebTAC itself must be revised to increase the value assigned to active travel projects. Looking at all the examples, it is no surprise that we are on course to overshoot our target level of greenhouse gas emissions by twofold. What we need is local and national government to work together to give us the best chance of hitting net zero. We Liberal Democrats propose that the government establishes a net zero delivery authority. This body would oversee the delivery of net zero, coordinate cross-departmental coordination and facilitate the devolution of powers and resources to local authorities. It would coordinate national and local strategies and provide information to central government about how projects can be delivered on the ground. A net zero delivery authority would work with local authorities and communities to engage with them about delivering, delivering net zero. This would primarily be carried out by local actors with a delivery authority providing leadership and trustworthy information about a national decarbonisation effort. A similar body was proposed in the government's commission uh, independent review of net zero, but unfortunately uh, the government has not responded in the positive to say um, that this is actually a very good idea. But I hope that the government looks at this again and maybe the minister can give us a different answer than we heard a few months ago. Local authorities also need a sense of direction. To start, local authorities need a statutory duty to deliver on climate change. Unless and until that happens, it will remain an issue at the mercy of local politicians. Mm -hmm. Climate change is massively underfunded within local government because it is not part of their core duties. Mm -hmm. Giving local authorities this statutory duty would be a game changer. It should also, uh, national government and local authorities do not yet have an integrated or systematic way to discuss, support and facility local net zero delivery in the short, and long, in the short or longer term. This must change too. There needs to be a regular... Order. I, I, 
I hope that the Honourable Lady, although I hesitate to interrupt her, I hope that the Honourable Lady will soon be concluding, because the, uh, the guidance is that she has 15 minutes for a speech such as this, and she has so far taken 20. Vera Hobhouse. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I, t I took many interventions, but I understand that she wants me to come to, to, to the conclusion, and I will be finishing soon. There needs to be a regular forum for feedback on the problems local authorities are facing, and a zero delivery authority can help facilitate that. Madam Deputy Speaker, local authorities up and down the country stand ready to do more to tackle the climate emergency, but often find themselves constrained by an over-centralised government. To make the net zero transition as, as efficient and sustainable as possible, we must all pull in the same direction. The latest research demonstrates that when compared to a nationally implemented program, devolved climate action would result in £160 billion worth of savings and over £400 billion in the wider, wider return. It is time, Madam Deputy Speaker, that this government acknowledge the huge potential there is for local authorities up and down the country to deliver net zero. The government must see local councils as true partners and provide them with the proper resources and powers they need in our path to net zero. The question is as on the order paper. Selene Saxby. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Councils are indeed well placed to help communities get to net zero and need to lead from the front with political leadership and genuine tangible change. Whilst recognising councils really do have real funding challenges at this time, the pandemic has taught us the importance of collaboration between local and national government. Climate plans in response to Council's declared climate emergencies are far too often just that, a plan. I wrote about Council's declarations of climate emergencies back in August 21, and not much has changed in far too many Council's responses since that time. The Cambridge Dictionary defines emergency as something dangerous or serious, such as an accident that happens suddenly or unexpectedly and needs fast action in order to avoid harmful results. Emergencies and crises, by their very names, invoke something of a helplessness in many, as it seems to be someone else's problem. But if we are to address climate change and achieve net zero, there is a need for everyone to feel they can take action now and not wait for another long-winded plan. Furthermore, our flag-waving Lib Dems, who have run North Devon District Councils since May 2019, took a full three years to even produce a plan um, and continue to fail to reduce their own carbon emissions, energy consumption, incentivise electric cars, and to date have switched just one vehicle to electric, announced with much fanfare earlier this year in their press release, which stated, on Tuesday the 18th of April, North Devon Council took delivery of their first fully electric asset, making a significant step in their commitment to sustainability and reducing their carbon footprint. The new electric asset, Eco City Sweeper 2 will be used to keep the streets of North Devon clean and tidy. It is equipped with the latest electric technology and has a working time of six hours on a single charge. Um, whilst delighted it's arrived, I'm not sure it's going to make the largest reduction in emissions given that it's replacing a man who didn't make many. I appreciate that our hardworking council officers have been very busy with the pandemic and the projects that have fallen out since, and the staff there really do do a fantastic job. But you would hope that the lead councillor responsible for the environment could have seen a way to at least install some solar panels on the new council building or secure an electric bin lorry or two. Time is of the essence and we need not reinvent the wheel. We should look where solutions currently exist and work to implement them. UK 100 brings together, as um, referenced by my honourable friend, the member for Bath, who I haven't thanked for securing today's excellent debate. Thank you. But UK 100 brings together local authorities across the country to devise and, crucially, to implement plans for the transition to clean energy that are ambitious, cost-effective and garner support. I've spoken at their events and seen how effective their solutions would be. I'm a big supporter and would urge others to join. Their Knowledge Hub offers excellent ideas for how local leaders can work to hit net zero. Declaring a climate emergency suggests that it is someone else's problem. We need climate action and we must work together in driving this action rather than producing endless plans. If councils need funding to deliver those plans, they need to speak with their MPs and government to detail how action will be taken. I live in a village full of tourists at this time of year, 
and yet it is still many, many miles to the nearest public electric charging point. The pace of change in Devon may be marginally quicker at a county council level, but we don't have many buses, so surely we are overdue at least a single electric or hydrogen powered one. Oh, of course. Um, I, I hope she will soon t talk to the leader of her district council and get some answers. But the problem about um, electric charging is, of course, a central government problem and a centralised grid, and that the grid connections are so incredibly um, difficult to achieve. And that's the same um, for a local authority who wants to put in more um, electric charging points, as it is indeed for community energy projects. Um, and we are sharing the concern about community energy projects. So the problem, does he not agree, is with the grid. Um, I thank the Honourable Lady for her intervention, and whilst I fully acknowledge some of the concerns around the grid, living where I do, I would acknowledge that that's not the reason what, that these charging points are not going in. I have parish councils that do not believe in electric vehicles, um, and that is holding back some of the rollout, uh, to be completely frank. So I think there's a, a, a lot more that we could be doing to drive through some of this change. Um, and I do fully recognise how much harder some of these challenges really are in a rural environment. Having previously led debates in this place on decarbonising rural transport and levelling up rural Britain. But some councils are leading from the front, as UK 100 is testament to. I just wish that any of the rural councils in Devon were on that list. Indeed, I support the UK 100's power in place, and I very much hope that the Minister will have had a chance to look at some of their recommendations, in particular looking at the more strategic, needs-based, long-term funding, particularly in a rural environment. This Conservative Government is a world leader in fighting climate change, and we have introduced the legislative tools to enable and encourage individual leaders and businesses to take action. We as individuals, business leaders and as councillors need to get on and actually do what we can to make change, rather than producing endless plans and PowerPoint presentations that do not in themselves solve the problem. And my door is open to any of my councils who want my assistance in driving North Devon towards net zero. Ah, Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Thank you okay. Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I congratulate the member for Bath on getting uh, this debate and also for the email which she sent me, inviting me to participate in it. Now, I think that probably she may well, well regret the invitation which she has given me uh, to do so, uh, because I, I want to raise a few issues which I think need to be considered when we look at this, uh, this particular subject. Recently in Northern Ireland, we have just finished the local government elections for the last four or five weeks. I have been around doors, knocking people's doors, speaking to them uh, about local government issues. I never heard well, I, one person mention net zero to me, and she objected to the stance which I took against some of the lunatic decisions made by my local council in putting wind farms on some of the most beautiful upland areas of East Antrim where they are vi visible from all around, one of the most iconic uh, landmarks in the area, the Slemish Mountain, where St Patrick was supposed to have sat, surveyed Northern Ireland, or that part of North Antrim, and then went out uh, as, uh, to evangelise, now blighted by what can only be described as mechanical triffids, uh, which have blotted the landscape, and of course, which are not good for the environment. I went to one of the wind farms where three metres of peat were taken off the mountain to put in the roads and the foundations, disturbing the wildlife habitat, providing uh, mincing machines for birds in the future and for destroying the, uh, the environment, as well, of course, as probably as releasing tons and tons of carbon in the process. Uh, but that, that was the only person who actually mentioned this issue to me. Most people were concerned about zero rate increases, zero tolerance of antisocial behaviour, zero tolerance of people being allowed to dump rubbish across the area. That seemed to be the concerns which people had when, when you were thinking about zero, uh, net zero in uh, the local government elections. On that point, 
Oh, well, yes, certainly. I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for giving way. Um, I mean, I knock on uh, a lot of doors all the time, not just at local elections. Um, and I'll be honest, there's not many people that mention net zero to me in that language, but they do mention their energy bills. And I would wager that the, on, that the Honourable Member did hear from people who talked about their energy bills. And I would uh, ask him whether he would agree with me that taking urgent climate action is actually a good thing to do, not only to uh, protect uh, the planet, but also to make people's homes warmer and to reduce their energy bills. And, I, and ironically, of course, those huge windmills which we see generating renewable electricity, when it comes to charging for electricity, because of the method by which they are paid, they get the rate which is the most costly rate. So if, for example, the, the last unit of electricity had to be reduced by gas, which was bought at premium prices on the spot market, that's the price that the wind, the, 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 the wind energy companies would get for the electricity which they produce. So it doesn't actually reduce people's bills when it comes to energy, because it, what it does is it inflates the profits of the companies which uh, don't have to pay for the expense of fuel but can charge accordingly, as if they were um, using the expense of fuel. That, but, but in answer to the Honourable Lady's uh, point, of course there are other ways and other actions which only make sense. That don't, uh, that you don't have to believe that net zero should be a target that uh, you aim for by 2050 or whatever the year happens to be, it makes sense for not, not to waste energy in people's houses. It makes sense to build houses which are energy efficient. No one's disputing that. What I am, uh, and the issue I am raising here today is whether or not at a time when local authorities are pressed, pressed for money to provide social care, in fact, you know, I, I, I listen to all of the issues that are raised about local authorities in debates here in the, uh, the, uh, in, in the House. And time and time again, I hear about the social care provision and the inadequacy of it, education provision, policing in people's areas, special needs education. And all I'm saying, Mr Deputy Speaker, is this, that when we have a debate like this, and of course, there are a whole range of things that people in this House are concerned about. The question is, should the priority for local government be to seek more grants to achieve a target of net zero, to provide more uh, facilities and more projects which aim towards that when there are pressing needs which are immediate, which people experience on a day-to-day -day basis when there, there, there are those more pressing needs. And, you know, on that I, point, yes. I'm grateful for the Honourable Member giving way. He will, he will know that um, every single winter we tend to have a winter crisis, but increasingly in summer we have a summer crisis in our NHS and care sector because, because of the heat waves that are now impacting people and affecting their health, particularly older people. So would he not accept that rather than trying to create this idea there's a trade-off between investing in the environment and taking climate action and somehow investing in people's social well-being, in fact really good initiatives are the ones that seek to address both and that is precisely what we're able to do if we take the right, a right actions. Well, I think, that's, and I don't want to get into the argument because I know that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you, you would probably um, ask me to, to stop at this point. But the association that the, the Honourable Lady is making is that somehow or other, the, um, what happens with the weather, and I don't think we've had any more extreme weather um, today than what we have had in the past. Of course, we've had heat waves in the past, we've had cold spells in the past. And that does tend to have, uh, have an impact. Uh, 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 let me just finish the point. That does tend to have an impact on some people's health. But to, to believe that somehow or other spending money on some of the projects which local authorities do and blighting the environment with some of those projects is going to save massive amounts of, of money on health care 
I think, is, is really, uh, there, there is not the evidence for it. Let me, uh, but, let, or, and let, me, and let me come to a, a second point. If we're talking about the impact which it has on individuals, let's just look at some of the initiatives we've had recently by the government. For example, in order to help local authorities because they say they can't meet the recycling targets, we now have a levy on, on companies uh, and, and, and on food producers. That it's, going to pre- it's going to cost, according to the British Retail Consortium, it's going to cost £4 billion. Add £148, million, uh, 148 pounds per year to people's food bill in order to give money to local authorities It's really a tax on the consumer to give money to local authorities to help them to achieve their their recycling targets. Is that likely to have an impact on people's health? At a time when we've got a cost of living in a a, a crisis, is that likely to be a a, a reasonable use of resources? But yet that is the kind of uh, expenditure that we're, we're getting um, in order to facilitate some of the, the, uh, the, the green away? policies. I will give away. Yes, First of all, I do not regret to send him an inv- invitation to participate in this debate because only through debate can we have these issues out. And can I come back to something that he said previously, basically saying that we, do, we did have wildfires and we did have floods. Does he not look at the facts and statistics about increased wildfires across the globe, the increased floods, what, the increased weather, weather extremes, they are facts that scientists are putting down for all of us clear to see. Does he not accept them? No, I don't. And indeed, the, the, the evidence doesn't accept that either, because the evidence shows that the number of people who die have died in extreme climate events has actually deteriorated and fallen quite significantly during the, 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 the past century. Um, and you know, I, I think that one, uh, even even the IPCC is, uh, is not c- claiming that um, th- th- that kind of um, uh, uh, suggestion, which has been made by the Honourable Lady for Bath, is correct. But let's look at some of the other things in which uh, uh, the effects, which is the, the, um, some of these local authority policies have had on people. In London, I mean, you can't lift the evening standard, but you every evening, but you read about the impact that the ultra. Uh, low emission zones is having not on people who make the uh, who uh, who make the decisions because they're usually all these all fairly well off and when we make decisions in this house uh, for many of the costs of those decisions don't impact on us but they do impact on low income families people who can't afford the latest car people who can't afford to pay the twelve fifty pounds or uh, uh, um, uh, the twelve pound fifty per day to come into uh, the the uh, ultra low emission zones in London. So again we've got to ask ourselves pursuing this policy in local authorities and uh, as I say some of the things that have been suggested today nobody could argue against but many of the other issues of expenditure and indeed it's significant how many times in this debate so far we have had funding mentioned. Funding which could be used on other priorities. And it really is a question of where do your priorities lie? Who who do you target the services and the the, the money you have for services at? And what impact does it have on people? And the last point I want to make is this. That whilst many people in this house, and indeed the former Prime Minister used, used to talk about he wanted Britain to be the leading country in the world in reducing um, carbon emissions. We will become the Saudi Arabia of renewable energy. The rest of the world, sadly, is not following. Indeed, it's significant. It's significant. And this perhaps puts it into context. It is significant that in the first quarter of this year, China... In its increase, not its total, its increase in carbon emissions in the first quarter of this year are equal to the total yearly emissions of carbon which will be produced by the United Kingdom. Now, I think when you put it in that context, and we talk about the fight against climate change and and reaching net zero, we have to ask ourselves, and I think many of our constituents will ask, Why impose additional costs on us? 
Why interfere in the decisions that we make about how we travel, where we travel, and the cost of that travel, and the cost of our energy and everything else, when quite clearly the rest of the world, and for very good reasons, when you consider that the average wage in Africa is $1,600 per year, the average wage in the United Kingdom is £27,000 per year. Can you really say that African countries that are now burning record levels of coal in order to produce electricity, to obtain economic growth, to provide, on, to provide employment for the people who we see coming to our shores every year because they're fleeing unemployment? Can we honestly say that uh, they're wrong in making those decisions? And if they don't, if they're not wrong in making those decisions, then we've got to ask ourselves the question, do we distort some of the decisions and, 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 and have an impact on the, mostly the less well-off people in this country by uh, pursuing a policy where at every level of government we have got this obsession with reducing CO2 regardless of the cost it, it has on individuals? Janet Davey. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's, um, it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member from <laughs> East Antrim. And uh, I say this because in the context of this debate, he's very anti and I'm very for. So hopefully I will uh, level this up in, in some way. But I want to really uh, first, by in, in responding to some of the comments that he had made, to say that I support every method that moves towards a net zero. And as I will continue in my speech, where actually I will be talking about uh, some of the, the health implications and how, you know, uh, uh, as um, citizens, we need clean air, otherwise we will suffer from the consequence of not having clean air. And I will be speaking about this and presenting some statistics. So I, I, I do, do hope that um, the Honourable Member will be um, uh, paying some attention to this. Um, now, I'm proud it was a, a Labour government under Gordon Brown that passed the Climate Change Act in 2008. This set a legally binding target for the UK to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 80% compared to 1990 levels by uh, 2050. This has increased to 100% in 2019. And unfortunately, 13 years of Conservative government has slowed progress. Since 2010, local governments have been slowly, um, their local authority funds have been stripped away. This has severely delayed and hindered what local authorities can do. But as we've already heard, local authorities are ambitious for change and ambitious for their communities. And I will focus on how this Conservative government and Conservative councils can probably learn a lot from the London Mayor and Lewisham Council from my area, if I can be so bold to say, which I believe I can. In 2019, Lewisham Council led by example and became one of the first local authorities in London to declare a climate emergency. Its many achievements in delivering net zero include its em climate emergency action plan being rated as one of the best in the country which obviously included schools, housing, cycling, green spaces and so on. Uh, Lewisham has planted 25,000 trees between 2018 and 2023. It increased food waste recycling rates by 250%. Lewisham Council is therefore stepping up and providing leadership where the government sadly isn't. Lewisham's Climate Action Plan is estimated to reach net zero for our borough by 2013 and would cost a minimum of 1.6 billion. Against the backdrop of the cost of living crisis and the hardship that people are experiencing, the government must resource local councils so they can deliver on the net zero plans. The Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has also set, also set a target for London to be net zero by 2030. To do this, he is also working to achieve over two million homes and a quarter of a million non-domestic buildings to become properly insulated. And I also support his action to extend the ULA zone. Right now, toxic air is thought to contribute to the premature deaths of 4,000 Londoners each year. That's 11 deaths a day. 
4,000 deaths that could probably have been prevented. I remember going to an event and hearing from a paediatrician that was speaking about particles in a newborn baby's lungs. That's, that's astonishing, it's shocking, it's awful to hear that the CO2 emissions that come from the air has produced this injury to a baby at such an early stage in this life. The, yes. I'm grateful to her for giving way and she's making a powerful case. I very much agree with the point she's making about air pollution and I'm sure she will uh, agree that things like air pollution hit the poorest hardest. They are less likely to be able to move away from busy roads, for example. So whether it's air pollution, whether it's fuel poverty, whether it's lack of affordable public transport, all of these things hit the poorest hardest. And so the statement from the earlier speaker somehow suggesting that there's a division between environmental justice and social justice is just plain wrong. I, I absolutely agree with uh, my honourable, honourable member, and I think she's absolutely right. Um, I remember... Um, uh, my, my own child saying to me, oh, mummy, it's, it's really quite, quite smelly here. And I'm saying, no, it's not. And then I'm thinking, no, I'm not the same height as my child. So I bent down and you could smell all of the fumes from all of the cars coming in. And, and it's awful and it impacts their health. It also impacts their well-being and it impacts the quality of air. We, should all, we all have the right to breathe clean air, but we need to make that possible. And that's a government responsibility to make that possible. Now, these deaths are preventable, which is why we must act now. And I was pleased to see that last week Sadiq Khan announced a major expansion to the ULES scrapping scheme. This will cover more small businesses in London and will cover London families receiving child benefit. There is also more support for charities. And if I return to the, to the point that the Honourable Member made for, for Brighton, is that um, poorer communities are suffering more from... Uh, polluted areas and dense areas, but we're also seeing um, uh, people and families and communities from diverse backgrounds experiencing more uh, pollution as well because of the, the area of poverty. Now, the Mayor for London has consistently called on the government to support the switch to cleaner vehicles through funding a targeted national scrapping scheme or providing additional funding to London as has been done for other cities across the country. The government must also do this for London, and if not, they must say, why not? And I do hope they are not failing to do this for political reasons. As I come to an end, it is clear to me that the Mayor of London and Lewisham Council are miles ahead of the government in delivering net zero. But I would love to see the government trying to outdo them, and I'd love to hear from the government how they are trying to make that difference rather than making it harder for them. So I urge the government to rethink its approach and I look forward to their serious response on this serious matter. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr uh, uh, Deputy Speaker. It's a, a real pleasure to speak. Can I commend, first of all, the Honourable Lady for, for Bath for bringing it forward. Um, and I know her introduction took 20 minutes. I have to say that every part of that was something that was worth listening to because I agree with her um, uh, and, and, and what to say. And I agree with the Honourable Lady as well. I'm going to set a trend in this house so are now. We're going to well, almost all agree in, in, the, in these things. But I want to, to say uh, it's very, very important to me. I look forward to the Minister's response. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the Minister has grasped the importance that it has for many of us here in this chamber. And, and really, to be honest, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, also for my constituents, because on the doors, the council elections, it was an issue for me. Uh, and my people told me that uh, they, they were concerned. Um, they are aware that the that the uh, the ice levels in the Arctic and the Antarctic are, are decreasing. They are aware that, aware that fr at flood levels across the world and the oceans are rising, uh, and they are aware of, of, of climate change. Now, some people, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, may not um, agree with that. But certainly, it's my opinion. It's an opinion of, of many of my constituents as well. So I'm, I'm very pleased to come along and speak on this. I've spoken in these debates before. The honourable lady has stood alongside her when she's making these comments, and I'm very, very pleased to to do that. Uh, and I also agree that the contributions that local councils and communities can make does and will not go unnoticed. And why is it important? Now you're going to say to yourself, well, you know, that what the council does uh, is small and and minuscule. Well, yes, it may be, but. It's all those small bits that come together that make the big picture change. Uh, and that's what the, the role of the councils are, and that's what I see it as anyway. 
I want a particular uh, uh, commend ours in North Down Council, obviously my uh, main council in my constituency, and Nisburn and Castle Ray as well, and Newry Moore and Down Council, because they and there is such an important role <coughs> for local councils and governments to play, and this must be paralleled throughout the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to ensure that the evolved nations are not left behind. I think it's really important that uh, we in Northern Ireland uh, play the same integral role that the Honourable Lady has referred to in Bath and others have confirmed, and, and, and not only Lady for Lewisham has, has just put forward the case as well. In addition to this, I take interest in what we can do <coughs> as a country to support our rural villages and towns transform to net zero too, which local government has a huge role to play in this. And it cannot be ignored the huge role of, of local government. My constituency of Strangford specifically, we are heading in the right direction on our contributions to net zero. Our council, my council, are doing it already because it's important we recognise we all have a role to play. So I've been contacted by a, a number of constituents from the village of Mully Ray in, in my constituency of Strangford. Just to give an example, uh, this is an old, outdated bus shelter that was in desperate need of replacing. Translink, uh, the, the bus company, were great and were able to replace it with a new insignia plus style bus shelter. In addition, they are also trialling solar power at this location in line with their new net zero carbon target. You're going to say to yourself, well, that's a small, a small part to play. Well, yeah, maybe it is. But it's a big part when it comes to collectively bringing all the small parts together. Um, so, so uh, and I also read recently that Worcestershire County Council, I'm not responsible for Worcestershire Council Council, by the way, but they are also installing new uh, sustainable bus shelters in Brimsgrove, which are powered using a combination of wind turbines and solar panels, which were the first shelters in the UK to be 100% off grid. It's estimated that each shelter will save us all, that's all of us. All the people in the world, all the people in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, 3.6 metric tonnes of carbon over 10 years. Last Friday, I attended, Mr Deputy Speaker, an event in North Down uh, that is looking at the provision of offshore wind farms. Uh, it's just off the constituency of the Honourable uh, Gentleman for my Honourable Friend and General Gentleman for uh, East Antrim. Uh, now, I attended it because I have a deep interest in fishing issues, Mr uh, um, Deputy Speaker. I attended it because I wanted to... Get make sure that what was put, been put forward will not impact upon the fishing sector uh, and, and the critical fishing grounds that are out there in the North Sea, uh, sorry, the North sea in the Irish Channel uh, and between Northern Ireland and Scotland. Now, uh, I have contacted the Anglo-North Fish Producers Organisation and the Irish Fish Producers Organisation and local, other local fishermen to ascertain whether and what their opinion will be in relation to this project. I have to say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will be, uh, <clears throat> I will be uh, nudged uh, and pointed in the direction that the fishing sectors want me to go by what they say, because I understand how important the pelagic fishing uh, and, and the lobster grounds are uh, to, uh, and the, or some of the other smaller crabmen as well. There, there's, a, there's a fishing ground there that needs to be preserved, so I need to make sure that all those things are in place. As someone who represents a rural constituency, I have stated that it has been part of it. There is sustainable and economic uh, transport for our constituents who live in the countryside. We need ideas for decarbonising public transport in more rural areas. You can't ignore these things. These things are real. They happen all the time where the population is more dispersed. Others have said we do not have the continuity or the regularity of buses that we should have in rural communities in order to incentivise people to leave their cars and use buses. The Gleiter scheme, that's the public uh, transport scheme for Dundal right through to Belfast. Um, the idea is to come, uh, park and ride, use the Gleiter bus and, and move. These are things which are progressive and helpful. And, and really, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think these are things that we can't ignore as well. We have seen the expansion of green transport to protect and preserve our atmosphere and environment. Um, and, and Ballymena writes buses, uh, their, their electric buses, and their, their hydrogen potential that they're investigating. We, these are things we've got to look at because these things are the future. My duty, uh, as, a, as a, a one who's of a certain vintage, Mr. Deputy Speaker, means that I want to leave something for my children and for my grandchildren. Uh, and I want to make sure that they have a, a, a world that they can enjoy some of the things that I've enjoyed for, for a great many years. Uh, we must con uh, continue to do this as time goes by. 
In Newton Arch, for example, people can charge their electric cars at the shopping centre, but if they want to go elsewhere in the town, they cannot charge the cars. So one of the things that I know the Minister is not responsible for Northern Ireland in its entirety, but I, I, I noticed in the figures that I've seen across the whole, the whole of the United Kingdom and Great Britain and Northern Ireland, while people were, more people were buying electric cars, it was clear that the electric charging points weren't keeping up with them. And it's really important if you're going to incentivise or try to encourage people to buy uh, electric or hybrid cars, then you really need to make sure that, that the charging points are up there at the same level. Uh, councils can play a role in that. My council has responsibility for it in my area, and it's one of the things I've asked them to do and things that we must push forward. Um, and councils have a key role in prioritising charging points. We, we should not be reliant on private companies who may put charging points only in places that are an advantage to them. I'm not saying that they shouldn't do it, by the way, but uh, why do they want the charging points in the shopping centres? Because they want you to shop there. Well, why isn't it, aren't the council putting them in the centre of town and other places where they could be accessible as well? The new additional funding, and you know, we, we have to incentivise things, we have to encourage things to make them happen. Um, and, and the vision of a net zero transport network one step closer to reality. I believe it is, and this is a way of doing that, such as double decker battery electric buses. They're 44% more efficient grid to wheel, saving energy costs and carbon. This is another example, I believe, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of how we are moving forward with our councils together to make it happen. There is such an onus net zero in meeting deadlines that incentives must be given to encourage people to adapt. Belfast, as another example, the biggest council in Northern Ireland, has recently launched its first climate plan, which describes the importance of the power of genuine collaborations between local councils and governments regionally. They recognise it. Belfast City Council in Northern Ireland, along with Ardson North Down Council, Newry Morning Down Council, and Lisbon and Castle Indeed, all of the councils in Northern Ireland recognise it. This consultation is so impactful because it lays out clearly and coherently that even though Belfast has only nine years of carbon available before it breaches the Paris Climate Agreement, the economic gain from decarbonisation would be immense. So, in terms of thinking towards the future, we are certainly on the right path. This debate is clear, reaching net zero through local government role. I, I conclude with this, Mr. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. It will always be a challenge to, to achieve 100%. Um, we can't, can't achieve perfection. can't achieve 100% perfection because I'm, not, I'm imperfect. Uh, so it's always hard to try and achieve 100% in their name. Uh, in relation to fully net zero, it's also difficult. But we are on our way there. The devolved nations have an important role to play. I'd encourage the Minister, and I'm quite confident that in the response that we get tonight uh, that we will have uh, encouragement to do so, to have another look at the levels of funding that has been allocated to the devolved nations to ensure that they have the funds available to level up and net zero targets. This can only happen, happen if we do it together. And I'm a great believer, as you know, Mr Deputy Speaker, the United Kingdom, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, we're always better together. But let's help each other in all the regions and, and make life better for our children for my grandchildren and for all my constituents. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I commend the member for Bath for securing this debate. The Housing, Communities and Local Government Select Committee's report into this topic in October 2021 suggested that it was clear that the UK will struggle to reach its net zero plans by 2050 unless central and local government work together. As a former councillor myself, I know how important councils and combined authorities are in delivering net zero. The Climate Change Committee said that councils have powers to influence around a third of the emissions in their communities. Though I have to say, it did feel a little like passing the book along when the government itself estimated that 82% of emissions were under council influence. But it has never explained how it came up with that figure. Despite the rhetoric from the government, they haven't implemented any statutory targets for councils on this subject. Now, it is true that most councils have approved some net zero commitments or, like Wakefield Council, have declared a climate emergency. In Wakefield, the Labour Council has made climate change a core function of their operations, with a dedicated team working on these projects. They have invested millions in replacing much of their fleet with electric cars and vans and are well underway with replacing nearly 45,000 street lamps with LEDs to reduce their energy consumption by 80%. 100,000 trees have been planted through a partnership with the White Rose Forest and they are also looking at building solar parks 
which could provide renewable energy, enhance biodiversity, offer training and provide new green jobs. The list of positive actions goes on, all to drive the change necessary to become a carbon neutral council by 2030 and help the entire district achieve this goal by 2038. But not every authority is like Wakefield. Some councils have not adopted proper plans and this is holding us all back. So I'd like to ask the Minister today what the Government is doing to encourage more climate change action plans. Labour recognises the important role local government has in this fight and that's why empowering our towns, cities and regions is at the heart of our plans. We will be consulting on Gordon Brown's commission about giving local leaders more financial autonomy and longer term funding settlements which I know the LGA have been asking for in order to help deliver net zero. We'll also be transferring more powers over skills, transport and planning to local leaders which would be a game changer. And in delivering Labour's Warm Homes Plan, councils will be at the forefront, helping to roll out our street-by-street -street retrofit programme, which will not only slash energy bills, but also help in their fight for net zero. I'm pleased that Wakefield Council are showing such leadership in this area, bringing forward the, action change, uh, the climate change action plan and backing it up with clear actions and investment. What we need now is a Labour government which will not only talk the talk, but deliver the real change we need, giving yeah, yeah. local governments the powers that they need and support that they need to accelerate net zero. Thank you very much. Opposition response, Kerry McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And this is what's happened to my missing notes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we know that the government's plan to reach net zero is totally inadequate, and that's the context in which today's debate is framed. 13 years of failure has left us exposed to higher bills, energy insecurity, lost jobs and climate delay. As the chair of the Climate Change Committee, a former Conservative cabinet minister has said, this has been a lost decade in preparing for and adapting to the known risks that we face from climate change. While the right honourable member for Kingswood, another Conservative, um, in his net zero view, review found that the Conservatives have failed on nearly every aspect of net zero policy. So how is the government responding? Doubling down on fossil fuels with billions in taxpayer cash handed out to oil and gas giants. Blocking the cheap renewable power that Britain needs with a de facto onshore wind band that has seen war-torn Ukraine build more onshore turbines in the past year than the UK. And still no response to Joe Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. It's dither and delay, there's no ambition and no urgency. Thankfully, we have local councils across the country, as we've heard today, that are trying to do the best that they can, albeit with very scarce resources. A number of members from Brighton Pavilion, Manchester Gorton, St Albans and York talked about the need for greater certainty and continuity of funding and an end to that piecemeal competitive approach which sets one council against another and can be unduly restrictive in terms of how the money is spent. We also heard from the Honourable Member of Strangford, I think, a uh, usual wide-ranging speech from electric vehicle charging points to lobsters, I think. Um, and the Honourable Member for Lewisham East um, talked um, you know, in very strong terms about the need to tackle air pollution and what the Mayor of London is doing on that front. Um, in terms of the, I uh, thank the Honourable Member for Bath for securing this debate. I do share her pain regarding cuts to bus services in our local region. I'd imagine she's having the same conversations with the Mayor for the West of England that I am about how we can try to subsidise non commercial routes. It was interesting that she only seemed to mention Lib Dem, Liberal Democrat councils when she was talking about the positive contribution that local authorities can make, but I'll make up for that by talking a little bit about what Labour councils are doing. And um, to start in, I don't need to say more about Wakefield because the Honourable Member for Wakefield did a sterling job in... Um, um, I, I do celebrate all local council work where people are really um, uh, uh, um, trying to re reach net zero. So I, I, I do appreciate um, that she's going to make up. Um, I'm sure there are many, many good councils across uh, the political divide that are making um, good progress on net zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I thank her for that, although she has now eaten into about 30 seconds worth of me talking and saying nice things about Labour councils. But um, the Honourable Mem Member for Wakefield talked about his area. In Bristol, the Labour Council has set up a 20-year City Leap project in partnership with Amoresco, um, a £424 million public-private investment in green infrastructure. It's groundbreaking. It's helping Bristol go carbon neutral by 2030, the same ambition as Wakefield, retrofitting the whole of our housing stock by 2030, reducing our CO2 output by 140,000 um, tonnes and creating over 1,000 green jobs in the process. And we're also shortly to see England's biggest word, wind turbine opening um, in my, the Honourable Member for Bristol North West constituency, community-owned, um, providing low-carbon electricity to 3,500 homes and saving nearly 2,000 tonnes of CO2 per year, as well as selling energy back into the grid and reinvesting it in local communities. In Hull, there was a recent event in Parliament with the aptly named Oh Yes Net Zero campaign, really good example of collaborative local working um, with 150 local organisations supporting the city's efforts to reach net zero. In Oxford, the Labour-led authority has been leading the way with innovative solutions, um, particularly in terms of battery technology, as well as being home to Europe's most powerful EV charging hub at Redbridge, a project called Energy Superhub Oxford, launched in July last year with the wider aim of decarbonising the city, has seen the latest in battery technology and infrastructure linked directly to the National Grid's high-voltage network for the first time in the UK. And I would echo what was said earlier about the need to ensure that the grid capacity is there to support these local innovative projects. And to give one last example, in Liverpool, there's a really, um, again, groundbreaking project, an agreement between the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority and the Korea Water Resources Corporation um, to create what could be the world's largest tidal power scheme in the Mersey. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, taking a place-based place -break, place approach to net zero is vital in ensuring that the opportunities from the transition start to finally level up the towns and cities of the UK, as opposed to letting them down, as this government has done. Around 90%, 95% of Britain's population lives in areas where the local authorities have declared a climate emergency. But as has been said, councils and combined authorities must be given the resources and powers they need to act. As one contributor to the Right Honourable Member for Kingswood's Net Zero um, Review put it, net zero achievements at local government level are in spite of government, not because of it. That would change under a Labour government which would recognise and value the role that local authorities can play and the immense difference that local action can make. We'd work in tandem with local authorities to deliver our Green Prosperity Plan of Capital Investment. This would support the creation of hundreds of thousands of jobs in every corner of the UK, doubling our onshore wind capacity, tripling solar capacity and quadrupling offshore wind capacity be financed by Labour's National Wealth Fund, ensuring that when investment flows into new industries in partnership with business, the British people will own a share of that wealth, as happens in other countries. The UK has, we didn't talk that much actually in this debate, um, surprisingly about retrofitting of homes. We have the least energy efficient housing in Europe. Millions of homes are going cold and premium priced heat is escaping through roofs, windows and walls. Again, Labour has a warm homes plan that would upgrade the 19 million homes that need it, cutting bills and creating thousands of good jobs for electricians, engineers and construction workers across the country. I think it's really important to stress this. This is about economic growth, it's about a future industrial strategy, it's about jobs for the future, it's about the prosperity of our local communities and it's about saving the planet at the same time. Local government has a key role to play in that. I just hope the government steps up and helps it. Thank you very much. Minister. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, and I welcome the opportunity to debate this really incredibly important issue. And I would like to thank all the honourable members from across the House for their contributions, which have informed a very interesting and at times very lively discussion. I would also like to thank the Honourable Member from, uh, for Bath for bringing this important topic to the House. The UK's 2050 net zero target is a government's priority. 
The transition provides huge opportunities for jobs, investment, innovation and exports. The UK is already leading the world in tackling climate change. Between 1990 and 2021, we have cut emissions by 48 per cent, while growing our economy by 65 per cent, decarbonising faster than any other G7 country. Our local areas will play a crucial role in delivering net zero. We agree that local authorities have great scope to influence carbon emission reduction, and many have strong ambitions in this area. And we can only consider the transition a success if its benefits are felt across the breadth of the United Kingdom. We know that we need local authorities to drive action across a range of areas, such as planning, energy, housing and transport. Of course I will. I'm grateful to her for giving way. On the issue of planning as an example, would she accept that actually government needs to give powers to local authorities as well? Because there are examples of local authorities who are trying to uh, implement green planning policies, but they're finding that their policies are being thrown out by local planning inspectors mm -hmm. because there isn't a net zero obligation at the heart of our planning process. Does she agree that that would be something the government could do that would facilitate the action of many councils around the country? All the way. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And as I will be going on to talk a little bit more detail about all of the government's plans, but we are confident that we are doing all that we can to achieve our net zero goals. Local authorities are well placed to align net, uh, net zero work with local opportunities. There can be significant uh, economic advantages for local areas, attractive private sector, net zero investment and building local supply chains. They currently have a lot of flexibility when they take action on net zero. My government is keen to ensure local authorities preserve that flexibility because, as noted, each region and community may require tailored approaches to reach net zero. So we do not believe that a new general statutory requirement on local authorities to meet net zero is needed. There is already a high level of local commitment within the sector, and our local government colleagues have told us that a new statutory duty isn't something that they want to do. The Government is already working closely with local government to help deliver net zero. In the 2021 Net Zero Strategy and in the Net Zero Growth Plan from this year, we set out how local areas can take action on a wide range of policies, including planning, transport and energy, as part of our overall strategy to reach the UK's 2050 Net Zero target. More detail on how we will meet our net zero by working with local partners is set out in the relevant sector uh, strategies, such as Transport Decarbonisation Plan from 2021. This covers, for example, how emissions from different forms of public transport will be reduced. The creation of Department for Energy Security and Net Zero helps drive overall delivery of net zero across government. The Department's officials work with counterparts across government to coordinate action, working particularly closely with Cabinet Office and Her Majesty's Treasury, and this ensures that net zero is prioritised in government. In working closely with local government on net zero, my colleague, the Minister for Energy Efficiency, co-chairs with the Local Government Association, the Ministerial Local Net Zero Forum, and this met in February this year for the first time. Alongside this, there is an Officials Local Net Zero Forum, which has met four times to date so far. And both these forums bring together national and local government to discuss the key policy and delivery options on net zero. The Department funds five regional local net zero hubs to help local authorities develop net zero projects, focusing on attracting commercial investment. These hubs have helped develop innovative tools and resources for local authorities, including Net Zero Go, which is an online platform supporting clean energy projects, and Scatter, a tool to help local authorities standardise their greenhouse gas reporting. Tools of this kind are supported by a wide range of guidance from government departments and other sources. I do recognise the importance of coordinated action across departments. But given the range of actions recently undertaken in this area, this Government does not think a net zero delivery authority is necessary. The Government has provided a great deal of funding for local government to reach net zero. 
through their core settlement growth funding, such as the Shared Prosperity Fund, and grant funding from Department and others. Local authorities can meet net zero goals flexibly in a way that best meets their needs. We have committed to explore simplifying local net zero funding where this provides the best result for net zero, and we will continue with this work. One approach we are testing is using devolution deals in England to pilot new approaches. We have announced wide-ranging devolution deals with Greater Manchester Combined Authority and West Midlands Combined Authority. These include first-of-its-kind pilots to simplify retrofit funding from 2025. We have also established from UK Infrastructure Bank, which is a lending facility of £4 billion for local authorities at preferential rates and has a technical advisory service. Communities also play a strong part in supporting our transition to net zero. And I am aware that the member for Bath's constituency, Bath and West Community Energy Group, work with local authorities in the area to support households to access funding for energy efficient measures in their homes. Many communities work closely with local authorities to access the funding and support they need. And the local net zero hubs can help local authorities and community groups to work together. We are already working in partnership with local areas towards our net zero goals, with examples of local innovation across the United Kingdom. By working together, I am confident that we can drive green growth across the country and deliver our ambitious net zero targets. The last two minutes, Tavira Hobhouse. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank all members from across the chamber for their contributions this evening. Bar one. We are all agreed <laughs> that the climate emergency is real he is, he is and that yeah, yeah, yeah. local councils must become a real partner for the Westminster Government. The Minister will not be surprised that I am slightly disappointed by her responses. I do hope that she takes what has been said here this evening to heart and, and persuades her Government that local government needs more power and resources. We need a statutory duty for councils to deliver, to deliver net zero. And I hope that the government looks again at our Liberal Democrat proposals to establish a net zero delivery authority. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Is as on the 